2023 was such a crazy year for media. Like, I don't need to tell any of you this. I'm sure you guys all have your own backlogs, but for me, I was going crazy. So much so that I didn't even have enough time to make videos this year, and I feel really bad about that. Like, I would start scripts and then just end up being like, oh, wait, let me actually step back and play the entirety of Resident Evil this year, or Armored Core 6 is out, let me tap into that. And I just never got around to making videos aside from the Trails ones. So in order to make up for the lack of videos this year, I'm actually going to go back and talk about my favorite experiences within any media, whether it came out this year or 20 years ago, I'm going to talk about it here. And so to kick things off, the same way I kicked off my year, we got to talk about Bochi the Rock. So initially, I wasn't going to watch Bochi the Rock because I'm like, you know, oh, it's just another seasonal anime that everyone really likes. I'm not really too into seasonal anime like that. I'm going to sit this one out. But one of my friends was like, you do know this is about music, right? And if you know me, if you look around on the channel, music is very important to me. So I said, I'm in there. I went and put it on and I finished it within like two days or something, which is really fast for me because I'm like a two episode per day type of person. I watch things very, very slowly. And I'm sitting here watching this and I'm like, yo, she just like me for real. And not because she's socially awkward because I'm anything but that at this point, but more so because she's a content creator and a musician who's like growing into her online persona, which really resonates with me and is a dynamic that I haven't really seen ever discussed in like media. For me personally, as someone who made a YouTube channel when I was like eight or something like that, I've been on YouTube for a minute, but I've always been kind of low key about my YouTube channel. And it's gotten to the point in the past three years where people are actually recognizing my videos and you know, the stuff that I make and the music that I make before they know me, that dynamic is very weird. And people are discovering me through my work. And so this story really resonated with me from that standpoint. From a musician standpoint, watching her go from not even knowing how to play guitar to being able to play on stage was something that I actually really experienced this year through, you know, DJing events and participating in open mics and even hosting my own open mic events. So I feel like that progression is really resonating with me on top of her being a content creator and having to grow into her fame. Bochi the Rock actually inspired me so much that the day after I finished this anime, I went to a concert and that combined with the anime, I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy an electric guitar today. And I actually went out the next day and bought one, came back home, started practicing, got the amp and everything. 10 months later, still ass. But you know what? That's okay. We got to learn. <laughs> we got to make our mistakes. Got to practice. Got to practice, 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 practice. So following up on that theme of creative expression and, you know, the creative process as a whole, I really want to talk about Fujimoto's one shot works because I feel like those really resonated with me as someone who is a creative. And if you don't know, Fujimoto is the person that makes Chainsaw Man, but I'm not going to talk about Chainsaw Man here. Fujimoto's one shot Goodbye Airy really resonated with me because I'm someone who doesn't really take pictures of myself a lot. And I didn't really realize that until this year. Like I did so much this year. I traveled to like every corner of the country, Canada included. I'd barely have pictures of myself and when I read this while I was on vacation I actually realized that I wasn't taking pictures of myself while I was on vacation having fun because the whole thing about Goodbye Airy is that the mom in that story only wants to be filmed in her best moments and not the entirety of her life and so when you look back <laughs> that, that's actually funny I'm going to talk about look back next but I just said it now but when you look back on, you know, these videos that you're making, you only see the best sides of themselves and you don't get the full picture, which is not necessarily like a bad thing, but it's also not good because you can start forgetting some of the small things that someone has whenever you only have an idealized version of themselves on film. So I was like, you know, I should start like recording myself when I think I look bad, quote unquote, or when I'm not having good days or when I'm not at my best, because it's really important for everyone to have those videos of myself and I feel like that really resonated with me and I also really appreciated how Fujimoto just doesn't take himself seriously even when he's saying something that's kind of profound like I was like man this is this is something deep and then he just throws like an explosion in the next panel and it's like I really appreciate that about his work in particular look back as a story really resonated with me as someone who really loved writing when I was younger and kind of fell off of it until recently the story follows the protagonist's journey and falling in love with and falling out of love with writing and I feel like that really resonates with me personally at this point in my life. When they initially started writing they submitted one of their works to the school newspaper or something like that and they completely get out class and then they develop this like burning desire to learn and overcome every you know naysayer 
And I feel like that burning desire is something that every creative kind of has in them. A lot of people lose that when they get older. And that's what Look Back goes into. And I feel like Fujimoto's kind of exploring his own personal desire and personal drive to make stuff and really goes back and understands why he's where he's at now and the moments where he felt lowest about his writing skill. And I really appreciate works where the artist or the creator is able to make meta commentary on their own creative process because it gives you a little bit of insight into how they feel or how they got to where they were and I always look for that. And as a perfect unintentional segue, I think that Hideo Kojima's book The Creative Gene is exactly what I'm talking about when I say books and works where the artist is able to give commentary to their own influences because this is literally what that is. So The Creative Gene is basically a bunch of essays that Hideo Kojima wrote about his favorite experiences and favorite media. And it's not just him saying, oh, the cinematography was perfect, blah, blah, blah. This is like, nah, when I was eight years old, I went to this place at this time with this person. This was happening in the world. This is what this led to in this work that I made. So it's literally like the blueprint to figuring out who Hideo Kojima is and the reason why he is who he is today because of media. And I feel like as someone whose entire YouTube channel is based off of that, that really resonates with me. I highly recommend reading this even if you're not a fan of Hideo Kojima's work just because they're good recommendations overall and it's good to get out of your comfort zone and watch a few movies or read a few books even if you're just a fan of his games. One of the books that I actually read based off Hideo Kojima's recommendation was called The Anomaly by Hervé Le Telly. But this book was actually really good. The way that he recommended it was like, just read it. And I said, wait, this dude literally wrote a book explaining with multiple pages why he loves multiple pieces of media. But this one, he was like, just read it. I can't even explain it. And that made me interested. That's how I get into a lot of stuff is when people are like, I can't even explain it. Just read it. I'm, I'm all for that. I love that. So I tapped in. I read the book. And I'm going to try to explain it to you guys, but my recommendation is also to just read it. Not for spoiler reasons, but just because it's good. So the way that I explain it to my friends is that the anomaly is basically the same structure as 13 Sentinels Ages Rim. The first half of the anomaly introduces, I think it's like 13 individual characters that have no plot ties to each other. And they're also in completely different years. So like some of these are in 2020, some of these are in like 2015 or something like that. It's crazy. And they're all completely different. There's like a rock star, there's a spy, there's a family that's going through a divorce, there's two brothers, there's a six-year-old child. They're all getting introduced and you're like, how do these guys even interact with each other? Like, why are they introducing these? And each one of those introductions are completely different genres. So the spy guy is like a thriller, espionage type genre. There's a romance genre. There's science fiction. There's, you know just a kid who is dealing with her family issues and all throughout these different character introductions you're seeing little bits and pieces of how they're all connected through like very minor things like someone mentions a song name that's the same as someone else who set the same song name 10 years before that and it's just little things like that that start adding up until you get to the second half of the book once the second half of the book kicks in the story turns into straight up sci-fi and the mystery of the first half of the book is revealed and how all the characters are related to each other and I was so confused because the second half of the book is literally like 25 pages. I'm like, they just explained everything. How is there still like 100 more pages left? But the third half of the book talks about how the aftermath of the second half and the first half of the book psychologically impacts all these characters. Basically, the first half is setting up the characters. Second half is explaining the mystery, which should be the end of a whole novel. Like it felt like the end of a novel. And the third half is like, OK, how do these people live with what happened to them? which I think is very interesting. So it sets it up in three completely different styles of story. And then it asks the psychological question of where do we go from here? The anomaly is very unique in the way that it switched structure between each act. And I actually read a story that was similar to this called The Notebook. But instead of talking about The Notebook and talking about more books, I'm going to switch to talking about a game because this game was actually inspired by this book and the reason why I read the book in the first place. If that's not confusing, that sounds kind of confusing. Let's talk about the game. So the game that The Notebook inspired is none other than Mother 3 of all things. And I actually started playing this when I was very young, like maybe 9 or 10. Never got through it until this year. I don't know why it happened, but I just I don't think I would have been ready for it regardless. But this game, I actually teared up like it's not a joke. There's a good reason why everybody wants this to be localized. To be honest, stop waiting for it to get localized and just play it now. So I actually played this because I was learning more about Shigesada Watoi, who's the creator of Earthbound and Mother as a whole. 
and i really was interested in his backstory because this dude did everything but game development and was like yeah let me just tap in and make this masterpiece real quick he's actually a copywriter and essayist dude does literally everything and you should actually look into what he does now it's very interesting to see his trajectory career wise but i looked into that and i was like you know what let me just play mother 3 and i cried like it was bro that was a good game right there. i don't even have anything to say about it just play it i think that everything that i want to say about mother 3 would just boil down to spoilers but just know that porky is like one of my favorite villains okay so now let me talk about this last book i promise you we'll get straight into the games it's been a good 10 minutes no game talk on a video game channel i know crazy but let's let's get into it so this book is actually a trilogy of three different books called the notebook the proof and the third lie and between each book the story continues but the perspective switches so even though the story is following two twins called claus and lucas which is where mother three comes from the first book is written in first person plural perspective the second book is written in third person and the final book is written in first person singular the story follows lucas and claus as they are forced to grow up during a war and a lot of the writing is very gruesome especially since it's told from the perspective of boys who basically become sociopaths and the second and third book sees them split up and have to grow up and become adults without each other while also having to go through this excruciating you know war situation which is very interesting from like a psychological standpoint and also just an exercise in character writing because how do you write a character that you should not be able to resonate with and they all have their own set of rules and how they write their own stuff too so there's a lot of different layers to it and i think that anyone who's a fan of good character writing and also just mother three should read this because there's a lot of plot points from this that are put into mother three like reading this right after mother three was actually very eye-opening Whew, okay so we got to cleanse all this nerd stuff out we're talking about books for the past like 15 minutes we need to talk about some peak real quick so i played multiple final fantasy games this year you know i played final fantasy 16 it was okay you know I, not my favorite i don't really think about it compared to other final fantasy games it was fun but when i look back on it i'm like you know that was a good experience i don't think i'll be replaying that game but the other Final Fantasy game that I played this year. Whew. Boy, let me tell you about this. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. No hyperbole, not even joking. Final Fantasy Origin Stranger of Paradise is one of my favorite games that I played this year. I played this game co-op with my friends. Unironically, one of my favorite Final Fantasy games. Unironically, one of my favorite co-op experiences ever. Like, I can't recommend this game enough if you have friends to play with. I thought this was going to be some kind of meme game. You know, all the jokes, everyone was like, chaos, chaos, all this stuff. Actually, super fun to play. Story was actually surprisingly really engaging. And I love Jack's character and how realized he is. Like, he's such a one note character that you can just put him in any situation and know exactly how he's going to react. And I think that's hilarious. I've been injecting him into every series I've played afterward. And it's just hilarious just imagining Jack in these situations. He's actually become one of my favorite characters in recent memory, <laughs> to be honest. But in all seriousness, this game from a gameplay perspective is actually super fun. So basically, it's Neo. So you can just say it's Dark Souls. And there's different classes. I think there's like 20 different classes. But you can pick two classes and switch between those two at any point in time. But every class that you have has a subclass within it too. You basically have an infinite amount of classes that you can make. So you can be a long range, you know, mage and then go up close with the samurai build. I wholeheartedly hope that they make Stranger Paradise too, because this is one of my favorite experiences of 2023. And I'm not just talking about video games. That was my favorite life experience of 2023. Disco Elysium is one of those games that have been in my backlog for literal years. And I've only just now gotten around to playing it. And I'm so glad I did this year. I got super caught up in the hype of Baldur's Gate 3 without actually having time to play Baldur's Gate 3. So I was like, you know what? Instead of buying this $60 game, let me just go back and play this stuff I already own. So I decided to play Disco Elysium. Disco Elysium, kind of like Baldur's Gate now, is one of those games that set the new standard for writing in video games, similar to Witcher 3 as well too, I guess. If you didn't know, Disco Elysium is heavily inspired by Planescape Torment, which is made by the same people that made Baldur's Gate. So if you like Baldur's Gate, you should actually really check this game out because you might like it maybe more than Baldur's Gate somehow. I don't I haven't played it so I can't really say that, but you might. I don't know. 
The driving factor of this game is that it constantly makes commentary on the player's choices, personality, and real life political alignment that you reflect in the game, and the story shifts around those said factors. Similar to the way that a dungeon master in a D&D campaign would commentate on your choices in real life, this game will directly talk to the player and say, you really made that choice again? That was completely opposite of what you said earlier, or of course you said that, everyone with this political alignment thinks like this. There are very few games that are as highly political as this game, and also are able to adapt their writing around player choices like this, so if you're a fan of writing in games like that, you should definitely tap into Disco Elysium. So this is actually the most recent thing that I finished on this list, and it's Higurashi When They Cry, the visual novel. I haven't watched the anime yet, but I plan to do that soon. Um, Umineko was a great visual novel. I loved it. I finished it last year. I'm still feeling withdrawals. I can't find that high in anything else. So I decided to go back and try Higurashi again. I initially bounced off of the original, I think in 2021. And it just wasn't hidden for me. I just didn't get what I was getting into. And I'm glad that I played Umi Neko before this one because I was able to see retroactively the themes throughout the entire When They Cry series. And I plan on making a video about it, so I'm not going to talk too much about it. I'll just probably leave it at that. Higurashi was good. I really liked it. Not as good as Umi Neko, but it was still great. Really loved it. But on the topic of great visual novels, the fan translation for Tsukuhime Remake finally came out this year and then literally like two days later they announced the official one, which was kind of weird. But I really had a blast with Tsukuhime, Su Soup of Hime Remake, I can't say that. Tsukuhime Remake. It was great, loved it. This idea and concept of like rebuilds coming into popularity again is kind of worrying me, but I'm really glad whenever they nail it because, you know, recently we had Scott Pilgrim, which was also great, um, Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, this. Evangelion was like one of the first to do it. Stuff like that is interesting, but I hope that we don't have too many of these rebuilds just coming out and like we have another fatigue where everything is just getting rebuilt, rebuilt, rebuilt like remakes are now. But to get back to Tsukuhime, it was great. Love the original. I was really surprised at the production values, but I guess they got that fake go money, so it doesn't really matter. Love Shiki's new characterization. It was really good. CL's route surprised me. I didn't expect it to be completely different. I miss Chaos, <laughs> but Blob was cool. He's not cool to Melty Blood though. But yeah, I'm probably gonna make a video on that, so I just gave y'all some bullet points. But Tsukihime Remake, great, loved it. Read it when it comes out. So earlier I talked about Hideo Kojima's book, but the reason I read that book was actually because I played Death Stranding for the first time this year. And I love Hideo Kojima's work. I'm surprised it took me this long to play it because it came out in like 2019 or something like that but it blew me away. I actually went in pretty blind. I really didn't know anything about it except for people were calling it a walking simulator, but knowing Hideo Kojima and how much he values gameplay, I'm like, it can't just be that. Like, it's, it's gotta be hidden like that. And I have two people that are pretty close to me that were really talking about this game, and they're like, you would love it. Like, thematically, you know, gameplay, all this stuff, you should tap in. So one of the only things that I knew about Death Stranding was the initial trailer in 2016. And I actually have a funny story about that. So 2016, I was talking to this girl at the time in high school and she loved Norman Reedus from The Walking Dead. And I was like, oh, Norman Reedus is in this Hideo Kojima thing. Let me send this to her to start a conversation. And I sent it to her and completely did not think about everything that was showing up in that trailer. Like the little baby, uh, him being butt naked in the trailer with this whale. I was like, wait, why did I send that? And she was like, why'd you send this to me? And I'm like, bro, I... I don't I just know you like Norman Reedus bro I don't know <laughs> like please don't be weirded out but anyway back to 2023 I love this game my initial reaction when I first realized what this game was going for I caught it on stream I was blown away I was like wait I get it I I understand what he's trying to say through the gameplay through the story and everything it's about connection I was so blown away is this one of the bridges we we're talking about oh I see I see Bro, Kevin, this is a game of the year. I get it. I get it. I get it. So this is another player that built this, right? To try to make it easier for me. Bro, I get it. I get it. I get it. So like Sam being someone who doesn't think they need humanity, he you literally just got helped by someone right there. And like the more he does this, the more he gets helped by other people, the more that I'm assuming that he is like going to be willing to be helped by other people and that's the whole point of the game and the gameplay itself is i don't know why people call it a walking simulator or like boring the progression is great actually walking around and like interacting with the world 
and also just balancing yourself is super engaging like more engaging than a lot of open world games and i was really having a lot of fun with that and i was surprised that there was combat i didn't know there was combat in the game even if it's kind of you know a little bit bare bones but i was still having fun with it regardless i tried to do everything in the game but i had to really like lock in and actually finish the game so i didn't really get to do all the side content but it's one of those games where you might want to go back and play it later just because it's literally tied into the theme of the game like you would you should want to go back and play the game after it's done but that's really everything that i had i'm excited for the second game to come out and also i let me let me talk about this real quick that game awards announcement with the hideo kojima and jordan peele project and it's actually going to end up being a you know a spiritual successor slash remake of pt that's gonna be so crazy like, i'm so excited for that i don't i usually try not to get super excited for things like that you know since it probably won't be out for like another two years or something but jordan peele and hideo kojima are you hearing this that's crazy and also i really appreciate that jordan peele was like oh yeah i played metal gear solid 2 nobody talks about metal gear solid 2 like that metal gear solid 2 is my favorite game in the series so i'm like okay this is it this is gonna be some gas all right, last up for my games that I really want to talk about is Armored Core 6, and this game was just a nice surprise. I wasn't expecting to get it. My personal experience with the series is playing it through, you know, demos and stuff like that on the PS2, and I never really got into the series, so this is technically my first game in the series. Armored Core 6 hit my friend group harder than the Ronald Reagan administration hit the black community, bro. Like, I was so surprised when this game hit and we were all just collectively playing it because for the most part, nowadays, most of my friend group plays multiplayer games, like whatever the flavor of the week is, and I'm playing my single player games, but this is the first time where we were all playing one single player game side by side, and we didn't even touch the multiplayer, but like twice, I think. It was just like six of us in the voice channel just streaming the game, talking about builds and all this stuff and i really missed that experience in gaming so this game was really bringing me back to that time where we were able to really do that with a lot of single player games so my friend group is super into mecha and i've never really been a big fan of mecha like at most i've watched gurren Logan, i've watched evangelion gunbuster probably missing a bunch but those are my main three that i really like and those are you know kind of offshoots of mecha so i decided hey why don't we just start gundam this year and I started with the original movie trilogy, Origin and 08 MS Team. I plan on going through the entire UC timeline and just going through that and then picking up the side stories that I really like. And so far it's been really cool. I've been actually super blown away by how timeless the anime is for the original. Aside from the animation, which doesn't bother me at all, the story is really good. It holds up a lot. And I was just really surprised at how visceral and how brutally they depict war in that series. They make it a very big point in every single series that I've watched so far to depict people just dying. Like, I was surprised to see that in an anime that was initially made for children about World War II, that they just show bodies, like, in establishing shots of the beginning of the scenes and everything like that. And they also get super in-depth with how it's impacting people psychologically and socially, too. I know a lot of Gundam fans would probably hate hearing me say this, but since I watched Evangelion first and went back, I'm like, whoa! Mecha has always been psychological, yes, it's always been psychological, and it, Evangelion was not the first one to do this at all. But again, I'm kind of just giving y'all bullet points at this point in the video, because I feel like I'm going to make a video on Gundam as a whole, as I progress through the series, like kind of, um, you know, a journal, a video journal or something like that, because I'm really enjoying this series a lot. If not that, I'll probably just write about it and post about it. But I actually got so wrapped up in this, I'm like, you know what? Let me go ahead and just buy a Gunpla real quick. Like, let me see what this is hidden about, too, because my friends are obsessed with that. Like, we have a dedicated Gunpla Discord channel, like, in our Discord, and we just constantly post in there. So I'm like, let me go buy my first one and build it. And it was a lot of fun to do. I spent, like, maybe six hours on it. it looks super cool, and I can already tell I'm going to lose a bunch of money on it. Especially since they have bottle kits that are themed after Trails of Cold Steel. Like, when I get my hands on that, I might have to throw up a stream or something like that. I'm super excited to actually end up doing that once I get a little bit better at making these. On the topic of Evangelion, I love that series. I gotta give a shout out to Hideki Anno. I watched all of his live action films in Gunbuster this year, and I really enjoyed it too. Anno's live action films are Ritual, Love and Pop, and Cutie Honey, and also Shin Godzilla, which I have seen before. I'll go in order starting with Ritual. Ritual was my favorite out of all these movies. It's about escapism between two people. There's a girl who wants to escape her past and loneliness through others and a director who films her to escape from his work as a director. So these two are pretty much just trauma bonding and if you've seen Evangelion, this is nothing new. It's just live action and a different type of trauma bonding. It was hidden though. 
Love and Pop is an adaptation of Ryu Murakami's novel Topaz 2, and it's the first thing that Anno made after the end of Evangelion, which is interesting to see from that perspective. This film follows a schoolgirl as she tries to get money for a ring that she can't afford with her group of friends, and I'll just leave it at that. I don't really want to spoil too much about this movie, it's one of those things that you've just gotta watch. Since this was Anno's first live action film after End of Evangelion, it was interesting to see the different shot choices and cinematography that he used throughout the film. It was very experimental, and a lot of his anime directing experience really comes through here. The last live action film aside from Shin Godzilla was Cutie Honey, and this film was hilarious and a ton of fun to watch. I was laughing out loud the entire movie, and I definitely want to watch it again soon. It was just an all around good movie. Another director's filmography that I went through was Wong Kar Wai, who made Fallen Angels, Chungking Express, and In the Mood for Love. It's a banger trilogy. Like, if you have not seen these movies, find a way. Each of these movies explores different forms and expressions of love, and they're all great. My personal favorite is Fallen Angels, and I think that Honestly, all of these deserve a video on its own, but I could talk a long time about Fallen Angels. The way that Wong highlights the city of Fallen Angels as like a transient setting for its characters to interact with and live in really impressed me from a writing standpoint. And the characters themselves are very eccentric, fun, and heartbreaking to watch. And the story is told in an engaging, non-linear way. It kind of reminded me of um, Killer7, to be honest. A lot of the shot structure really reminded me of Killer7, and I guess that since this came out first, Killer7 might have taken inspiration from this, but it just reminded me of that. In the Mood for Love, which is his last film, explores the progression of passion, intimacy, and relationships, and how quickly it can build and also fade away. And there's so much tension in this film, even though there's like little to no physical contact, it's crazy. And finally, Chunking Express further explores the city as a setting of transience. Characters within this setting long for love, but can only really find or express it in short, unfulfilling bursts. Overall, I think these films are great and I highly recommend them even if I didn't go into too much depth just because this video is getting kind of long and I don't want to talk about movies too much. But I think this theme of urban settings and relationships really resonated with me because I ended up watching two more films that fully explore these themes. Haru by Yoshimitsu Morita and Sidewalls by Gustavo Toretto are two films that explore the crossover between the internet and relationships in two completely different eras. Haru is set in the late 90s and Sidewalls is set in the early 2010s. Haru is a story that's told in the era where, as a society, our online and offline personas were completely separate and true anonymity was still a thing. To access their digital lives, people had to physically go to a single spot in their house. This dynamic and limited access to technology gives the relationship between our protagonists a slow burn as they platonically update each other on their daily lives and eventually build enough trust to make effort to actually meet each other. On the other hand, Sidewalls takes place in an era where the first iPhone had only been out for three years at this point. People were still connected to cell phones, but mainstream internet access was still partially tied down to desktop computers. At this point in time and now, our digital lives are a part of our real lives and we're able to essentially stalk people through social media. The protagonists of this story meet on a dating website and distrustfully begin to talk to each other online, and they don't even realize that they pass each other every single day. As a real yearner impacted by urban isolationism, these two films exploring the same theme in two different eras and coming up with two different conclusions really resonated with me and I definitely plan on making a full video exploring these two films. Last film I want to talk about today is a film called Come and See and this is a movie I cannot recommend lightly. Like, I genuinely mean this. Uh, this film is genuinely traumatic and not just for the child actor of the film but for the audience as well. Come and See follows a child soldier who wants to join a war with every fiber of his being until he deeply regrets it and realizes why that was such a terrible idea. One of the moments that stays with me with this film is when a bomb goes off near a protagonist and the audio of the film just permanently changes for the rest of the film. Once this bomb goes off, we as the audience are only able to hear one side of the screen for the rest of the runtime, just like our protagonist. And I think that a director that wants to drive that point home to the audience to the point where he's, uh, he's editing audio, it just, it just goes to show how much he wanted to convey this message and how effectively he was able to do that. If you can stand it, watch this movie. I have a hard time even just talking about it, but it was a great movie that I'd never want to see again. Finally, to end this video in the year of 2023 off, I need to talk about one last series. And I'm going to be completely honest, I haven't said a word about this series online, but it stayed in my mind throughout the entire year and I even bought the light novel book sets for it. This series is Monogatari, and one thing about this series is that I've only heard negative things about it from people, and I just didn't have any interest in it whatsoever. Like, the only thing I heard was toothbrush, toothbrush. I'm like, bro, what? I, I don't even know what it is. I haven't seen it. I'm not messing with that series. If I don't know what you guys are talking about. You all are weird. I'm not rocking with this series. But I had a few friends who I was surprised to hear this from that were like, nah, actually, it's really great. 
and then they hit me with my favorite words that I love hearing when I have time to hear them. I don't even know how to describe it. You just have to watch it. Every time I hear those words, I have to take it as a challenge because I'm like, well, I can make a video on it. And like, I just love trying to figure out how to describe things that people don't know how to describe. So let me tap in. So I decided to give the series a chance with one of my friends from the beginning. And we ended up watching the entire series and it took a year. Like I'm a very slow watcher. We actually started this back in November of 2022 and we finished it in like September of this year. Once I actually got into this series, I found that it was one of the most unique anime experiences, one of the most unique animation experiences that I've actually ever seen. Like this, this anime takes the medium of animation and just runs with it. Like this is the most creative thing I've seen from animation in a long time. The story is an adaptation of a series of light novels that relies heavily on dialogue and wordplay, which is complete opposite of animation. So I'm like, if they're mainly just sitting here talking 90% of the episode, why is the animation going so crazy? Like, how does that even work? The reason why Monogatari is so engaging to watch is because the shots are just constantly changing and being experimented with no matter what. You can really tell the animators were having fun and they just draw inspiration from literally everything. Like there's constantly references to the medium of animation itself, cultural references. Every single frame of this anime is engaging, fun, and dynamic despite most of it just being conversational and the shots and framing of Monogatari never stay still even if its characters are doing so themselves. It also helps that the writing is engaging as well, even when it takes its detours. The characters all have a very distinct voice, dialect, and habits that make each conversation feel like a figurative and sometimes literal battle of wits. As the plot progresses, we learn that each of Monogatari's characters are also deeply connected with each other despite not being initially connected. And each arc explores an individual character's past in relation to each other as well as the protagonist, which builds a web of relationships as the story progresses. The story is also told in a non-linear order, which gives the series heavy rewatch value if you're into that. All in all, I love Monogatari, and I would never recommend it or mention it to anybody unless you're a super nerd. Like, you have to be a super nerd to get into this. I would not recommend this to anybody, but I love it though. And with that... It's the end of the video and also the end of 2023 as a whole. And before we go, I just want to thank y'all for some milestones. We hit a million views this year. Crazy. We hit 1,500. We're at 1,800, almost 2,000 right now. Only up from here. I plan on deviating a little bit from what I typically do and trying out some new types of videos because I'm into a little bit of everything, as you can see from this video. So if there's anything you want to hear from me in particular, just let me know. I'm down to talk about anything, if not right. And on the topic of that, I really tried not to script this video as much because I wanted to practice just talking to the mic and I really had a lot of fun doing it. So I might do it more in the future with, you know, series that I don't want to make a full video essay on. So let me know if that sounds interesting, but I'm not going to take up too much of your time. Thank y'all. Have a good rest of the year. Have a happy new year and I'll see you in 2024.